गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन बिहाफ ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ ह्यूमैनिटीज एंड सोशल साइंसेस ऑफ आईसर पुणे आई वेलकम एवरी वन फॉर द सिक्स जस्टिस पी एम मुखी मेमोरियल ह्यूमन राइट लेक्चर इट्स एन ऑनर एंड प्रिविलेज टू हैव जस्टिस गौतम पटेल टू डिलीवर दिस टॉक दिस सिक्स टॉक इन द सीरीज आई रिक्वेस्ट प्रोफेसर सुनील मुखी to introduce the speaker to the audience thank you so much chaitra so welcome everybody to this lecture which is the sixth in a series um right away i should first tell you that the first lecturer in the series is here and he's attended most of the lectures that we've had over the years vivek divan he's sitting there and his video of his lecture which was given in that balan center uh, auditorium Uh, is up on youtube few more are also up uh, so i just need to say a couple of words about um, this lecture series so it was instituted in memory of my father and so uh, the, uh, the the main thing is about him which you need to know only is that he was a strong supporter of rational discourse on social issues of the rights of individuals and the need to uphold and protect the aspirations of human beings from the pressures of powerful organizations both public and private this is something i didn't write somebody has written this about him some jurist and um he really believed uh, very passionately in this cause and uh, i thought that it would be fitting to start this lecture series in his uh, memory and uh, i'm very happy that icer has agreed to Uh, host the series um, uh, here, and uh, last year I gave an endowment to ICER, which uh, should ensure that it will be held here in perpetuity. So even when I'm no longer here, there will be a annual uh, lecture in this series, and uh, and I hope all of you will uh, keep attending and bring your friends. So it's been a wonderful piece of luck. Uh, to have uh, justice gautam patel who it turns out i have known for many years and been to his house many times and i know his parents and all that uh, um he is a, a very distinguished judge of the bombay high court until april this year when he retired and he very kindly agreed to come and give this lecture now i have a long bio of him and i was planning to read it out but he's been saying no 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 and actually i also don't want to stand between you and the lecture uh let me though say that he is uh, he has written a lot he is a very deep thinker as we'll find out uh, he can actually be also be quite funny as i found when reading some of his famous judgments um and uh, i should say that environment has been one of what i understood from the cv was that the environment was one of his uh, very major uh, concerns and he has written and studied uh, and lectured a lot on that studied also initially and uh, today he is going to talk about human rights in an age of pervasive surveillance we, uh, we already had one lecture in this series by usha ramnathan also on surveillance and um, uh, and i hope and of course things have moved since then and i'm hope i, I think we'll get a very very fresh perspective so without further ado uh, we welcome gautam patel good evening uh, is this thing working thank you very much dr mukhi and i serve for this opportunity justice mukhi was a judge of my high court but well before my time and it is an enduring regret that i never got to know him personally few of my generation did and to my very great dismay the bombay high court website about him is entirely blank but the arc of his life which i have gleaned from what sunil made available is astonishing parsara mukhi known as parsa began his career in pre partition india and in what is now pakistan in its capital karachi as you know at that time karachi was part of the bombay presidency a vast tract of land that ran from north of karachi to the southern part of the subcontinent and west to eden 
There is a marvelous description in a post by Jay Mukhi, Justice Mukhi's brother. It paints a vivid picture of a most unusual man. Here's a snippet. In 1937, Parsa was 19 and I was 9. That was the year of the Jubilee celebrations at the DJ Sindh College, Karachi, at that time affiliated to the University of Mumbai. I was an avid spectator and I have a vivid memory of Parsa in his straw hat and striped blazer acting Maurice Chevalier and belting out his songs and gags. What a lively person he was, full of banter, witticism, leg pulling, an endless argument on matters of no consequence, full of grandiose plans, the buildings of castles in Spain and the villas on Greek islands, always sure of a visiting professorship at Harvard or Berkeley, all of which did no one any harm, but served only to boost his morale and keep him in good cheer. A pampered child in a once too rich family, he loved gadgets and toys. He loved elegance in all things and always strived after perfection. In clothes, book bindings, hi-fi equipment, dictaphones. At St. Xavier's College, he got addicted to music, prom music to begin with. A clean man to the end, his only escapades were finding a good seat at Sir Kawasji Jahangir Hall. Those were the days when Meli Mehta was the foremost violinist in Bombay. Much of his allowance went into gramophone records and it was he who introduced me and my younger brother to the pleasures of Western music. He once admitted having seen the Great Waltz no less than 11 times. He got his first heart attack in 1961. In Breach Candy Hospital, he had barely recovered. The oxygen cylinder was still in the room when he persuaded the matron to let him have his beloved Sony tape recorder by his side. That attack could easily have crippled him. But he went on with great gusto, improved his law practice considerably, continued his sea cruises year after year. His natural inquisitiveness and regular visits to the engine room brought him rich divid dividends in marine collision cases. He led a fuller life than before and became Mr. Justice P.M. Mukhi of the Bombay High Court in 1972. Connections, connections. I recently met Mr. Meli Mehta and I have been invited to serve on the Meli Mehta Music Foundation's Board of Trustees, a great honor. Justice Mukhi served as a judge in the Sindh Judicial Services before partition. Then came that horrifying time. Uh, in another aside, I must tell you that on a recent visit just a few months ago in May, I had the good fortune to visit the Partition Museum in Amritsar. It's a jewel of a museum. And I think it is impossible for anyone to see it and not be moved to tears. Justice Mukhi was one of the many displaced persons of that time. He came to Bombay, like many of the Sindhi community, again, one with which I share another bond, study stuff for another day. When he was appointed a High Court judge in 1972, he addressed a gathering in what we call a reference. Until recently, reserved for those who had died, but now done for retiring judges too. We do not have them for newly appointed judges, a shame really, for as Justice Mukhi pointed out in his address at that time, it is a good introduction to what one might reasonably expect of a newly minted judge. He said, if then the reference is a method of recording an event like the appointment of a judge, does it serve any other purpose? I think it does. It is a form of introduction and lends a human touch to the event. The new judge is welcomed and on his part he speaks about himself, his life, his hopes. Instead of a name to many who have not known him, he becomes a person. He spoke then of other things but it is the words with which he ended that resonate and I think should resonate with all of us. Well, the time has come to get on with the task. Tradition 
gives to my task a tinge of onerousness but with your cooperation as in the past i hope to succeed there is an islamic proverb which says that an hour in doing justice is worth a hundred in prayer i shall be doing a lot of prayer in the time since the task has become more onerous sometimes i think that it borders on a human rights violation itself now many years ago in a context i shall not bore you with i had occasion to visit the foreigners regional registration office behind st xavier's college in bombay for some reason the officer there thought i might be interested in some special branch archival records he took me up two floors to a chamber where there were rows and rows of leather bound volumes he took me through some of them i was astonished at what i saw this is the year 1915 some were even older and they were a minutely detailed record in an age of no cameras no internet no hyperlinking of what we today call surveillance you really need to see some of this i took photos on my cell phone and i will share four of these with you now sunil can we just do this just shall we fire up the pdf or what should we do yeah it's it's already fired up you just have to open it over here all right have a look at this this is the first one can i don't know if you can see it yeah. september 8th this is 1915 krishna ayer arrived here from madras about the first instance no intimation of his arrival was received till a telegram from pila a confidential informant reached me on the 6th so his exact date of arrival is not known he put up with mk gandhi at his settlement at kochrab near amdabad it appears that mr gandhi ran across this man when he was on the madras side and therefore the visit to mr gandhi now at least that is the version given how do they know this he did not try for employment at any of the mills here but stayed with mr gandhi he went to the meeting held in prema bai hall to celebrate the 90th birthday of dada bai nauroji but did not speak he got a telegram on the 4th to say that his mother was sick so left on the 5th for madras he is expected to return here about the end of this month and now if mr gandhi's settlement is to accommodate this stamp of a man it cannot be so innocent as its promoters wish to make out okay that's one now how do i go to the next one all right here's another entry i'm looking at the second one 1124 mr tilak is arranging to have his book on the bhagavad gita translated into hindi gujarati kannada tamil and telugu later he will also consider as to having translations made in bengali now below this mrs annie besant arrived in bombay from nagpur and left for madras the same night she put up in narottam moraji's bungalow at pedo road she went to see mr dada bhai nauroji at varsova then there follows a long extract of annie besant on home rule and this is possibly one of my favorites the members of the pathare prabhu students union celebrated the festival of dasara on sunday last at the marathi granth sangrahalay hall when mr mohammad ali jinnah bar at law was in the chair really a large number of members as well as some guests were present then there follows this long extract which i'm not going to read he was then garlanded by the president of the union and a hearty vote of thanks to him was passed with acclamation the next entry saraswat brahmins arrived from belgaum via baroda on the 27th db kamalkar gunaji nayak The movements of number one, Kamalkar, age thirty, height five feet seven inches, long thin mustache, wears glasses, says he is a schoolmaster in Belgaum camp, are under observation. And then there's this. Bal Gangadhar Tilak arrived in Bombay from Pune 
on the 10th instant at 11 a.m. and went to Daji Abaji Khare's bungalow at 4 p.m. the same day. He went to the Shrutibodh office where he saw Kolatkar. He then went to Khare's office, then to Sane's house and since Dr. Moreshwar Gopal Deshmukh's house. On the 11th instance, he went to Mazgao to meet Joseph Baptista, but not finding him, he returned home. He then went to the Swadeshi cooperative stores and next went to see Muhammad Ali Jinnah, barrister at law. He was with Jinnah for about half an hour. He spent his evening with Dr. Moreshwar Gopal Deshmukh, Mahadev Rajaram Bodas, Vishnu Hari Atole. This last paragraph is terrific. On the 12th instant, he went to see Baptista, with whom he stopped for about an hour. He went to see Marathe, a school teacher in Mazgao. At 1 p.m., Tilak and Vaidya and da Daji Abaji Kare went to see Mrs. Annie Besant. He left for Pune on the 12th instance. The object of his visit was to see his daughter, Mrs. Sane, who has had a miscarriage. Now, remember one thing. These are printed. They have entries. But every one of these entries is in some amazing manner, cross-linked and hyperlinked to other entries. There is in fact much more. Can I have the lights please? For instance, there is a narrative about a sinister Parsi gentleman who they found loitering around the Bombay docks and the message was to apprehend him when he disembarked from the steamer at Aden. No, it's not Farooq. <laughs> The detailing is incredible. Uh, in one instance, there is even a dinner menu. What's missing is equally intriguing. The pages about Gandhi's flight just before he was to be arrested in Mumbai, leaving for Ahmedabad, have been torn out. They are in the British Library. Uh, today, these volumes, by the way, have been digitized, at least in part up to 47, I think. And they are available for free viewing in a special museum at the police commissioner's office near Crawford Market. So that's another thing not advertised. If you can do it, please do. Now, as you can see, more than a century ago, we were already being subjected to this thing we call surveillance. It was done manually, and the books, they were not handwritten ledgers, as you see, they were printed, which means they were drafted, vetted, corrected, proofed, and then printed, are astonishingly well preserved. Before we come to the why, let's take a quick look at the what. I might be doing a disproportionate amount of etymology this evening, but bear with me. The word surveillance is from Middle French, traceable to Latin roots, vigilare to keep watch. In French, sur or over and veille, watch, together overwatch. In our contemporary understanding, it is close observation of an individual or a group today whether or not persons of interest, that is to say under suspicion and in espionage, a systematic method of constantly observing and recording events, persons and places by manual or electronic means. That's the what. The why is far more difficult to understand, at least partly because surveillance is very ancient. Indeed, I would venture to suggest that if one reads old texts for their subtexts, one should expect to find mentions of what is nothing but surveillance going back in time several millennia indeed several centuries before the common era. Surveillance in some avatar seems to me to always have been an adjunct of organized civil society, most especially as a feature of urban living from the oldest times. The reason is, probably, that unlike the more thinly populated and more dispersed agrarian settlements, Urban life demanded almost from the beginning a maintenance of what people love to call law and order. There is of course an undeniable argument to be made of the necessity for maintaining law and order in intricately woven and complex societal settlements. 
The absence of law and order would be urban chaos and anarchy. And the term encompasses everything from rules of the road and parking to vending, passing by, cleanliness, hygiene and so forth. But where lies the boundary? At what point can one legitimately say the need for overwatch ends? At one's doorstep? Suppose as a thought experiment we flash forward from 1915 or even earlier, 2500 BCE to 2024 and ask ourselves this question, where or what is the threshold at which surveillance must stop? At what point do we say, so far and no further? The answer to this apparently innocuous question is infinitely problematic. And the problem comes from two different directions. First, the choices or the lack of choices that are thrust upon us, which I will call external pressures. And second, the choices that we freely make for ourselves with the tools at hand. While the two have different profiles and different intrinsic dynamics, they also share fundamental commonalities. Let me explain. Can you opt not to be on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram? Not to have a smartphone with WhatsApp and Google Maps? Evidently, yes, you can. You would get lost in Pune, but sorry. Will it impact your life adversely? That's a hard call, but it is one that is still up to each of you to make. But can you function effectively today without what we call ID proof? Aadhaar, a driving license, a passport, a voter's ID. I dare say we should be hard put to find a single person among us here today who manages to get by with none of these. The common denominator between these is data, specifically data about ourselves. We all use this word and we salt almost everything with it. We also claim ownership of it. But what is this word and what does it imply? We understand data today to be a compendium of what are called values. How much, how good, how bad, true, false and so on. On its own, data is useless. It's just a collection. It is the interpretation of that data in ways more or less formal or structured that yields something of worth. The process of interpretation is an algorithm. Data is the plural of datum. This is a Latin word and here's the surprising thing. In Latin, the meaning is the thing given. Mark that, please. It is the neuter part, past participle of dare, meaning to give. Data datum were first used in English 500 years ago in the 1640s. And the words remained that way for the next four centuries until the middle of the 20th century when it was first adopted to mean storable computer information. The word data processing, again processing should be noted, arrived in the mid-1950s. Data is not information. And information is not knowledge. On their own, data and information are both relatively useless. But once we process that data, we begin to know certain things, patterns, habits, preferences, tendencies, likes, dislikes, and it gets more intimate. We know about dress and food and travel and reading and entertainment. We use this knowledge, data processed in some form or the other, even to define relationships and through that to define ourselves, think of Tinder or any dating app and you will see exactly what I mean. Let me use this to set the stage for what follows. Pause to remember the origins of the word datum, the concept of giving a thing. What is this thing and who is giving it 
to whom and why. As soon as we latch on to the concept of giving, we must accept the other face of it, namely proprietorship or ownership. So there is now the giving of something by someone who owns it to someone else. At a philosophical level, this poses problems. For instance, take an elementary chunk of data, your date of birth. These are just numbers, values. This is not a question of the intrinsic value of that date. More importantly, it becomes data when it is given, that is to say when it is shared by the one to whom it attaches with someone else, when it enters a birth register, for instance. Data is the communication of a number, a value or a set of symbols. Data travels to the level of information when the symbols or values of data pass through some sort of filter. Knowledge, the next level of abstraction, builds on awareness, information, and speaks to the awareness of data and information, and then injects it with something more. Let's take an example from Google Maps. The distance by road between two points on a map is data. A message about the condition of the road or the traffic on it at any given time is information. A suggestion, and Google Maps does all of this, a suggestion about an alternative or faster route comes from knowledge. To complete this part of it, let me just mention the next level, wisdom. And that is a further refining. It gathers data and information and available knowledge to make an ethic-based call fundamentally on right and wrong. Wisdom is tied root and branch to governing concepts in law, justice, equity, fairness. But we would do well to remember that while repositories of data and information can be relatively anonymous, and knowledge, even with its incidence of authorship, has the merit of being widely accessible, wisdom is a quality that is extremely personal. It is shaped by a number of seemingly disparate influences, not just data or information or knowledge. Your politics, faith, attitudes, backgrounds and world views come into play. Data, information and knowledge are all to varying degrees agnostic. It does not matter what job you are doing, or what societal role you fulfill, they remain the same. Wisdom is constantly shape-shifting. A common mistake we make, especially in this country, where obeisance and being subservient is almost a national trait. We are constantly in search of someone whose feet we can touch, is to assume that a position of authority necessarily brings with it wisdom. Our collective experience, and yes, I do mean to include the judiciary, should tell us that this is entirely untrue and there is no valency between these two. Abir Mukherjee is a writer I much admire. He has a series of novels set in end of the century Calcutta about a British policeman, Sam Wyndham, and his Indian assistant, Surendranath Banerjee, nicknamed Surrender Not. They are marvelous detective tales stuffed with atmosphere and context from opium dens to stately mansions and starchy clubs, and always, always, behind it all, the Hoagley. And all of this in the background of the independence movement. In one of these, a book called A Necessary Evil, there is a wonderful line which I am adapting from what a female character says to Sam Wyndham. Sir, Captain, she says, remember this, the truth no more entails justice than high office entails wisdom. Now let us set this in the context we have derived. We have not just data, information, knowledge, we have repositories of these. And of course, I'm excluding wisdom. 
because truly valuable repositories of wisdom are very hard to find. In another word, we have libraries. Now permit me a small digression here since we are at ISA's seat of learning to which libraries are crucial. Four or five years ago, speaking at the Asiatic Society, I spoke on libraries. I'm quoting from this. The Library by Night, a marvelous book by Alberto Manguel, is a roller coaster ride through the libraries in time and history, from Alexandria to the Internet. The Library as Shadow, the Imagined Library, the Library of Memory, and the Libraries of the Unwritten. It is, in parallel, a story of human civilization tied hand and foot to the library. Parenthetically, if the internet is today the library of libraries, and libraries are indeed matched to human civilization, then what precisely do we make of an attempt to deny access to the internet to an entire region? Libraries are primarily, primarily places of storage. From their earliest beginnings, humans have been collectors. The physical act of possessing, keeping and preserving an object seems to represent something essential to the human condition. Libraries are also tied to mankind's innate sense of history and the importance of the past. Libraries everywhere abound to memory, language and communication, but m perhaps most of all, to a need for information and retrieval. Human beings are perhaps the only creatures who store information outside themselves. In a stunning passage in An Alchemy of the Mind, Diane Ackerman writes, but the skull can only swell so much and still pass through the birth canal. Even after the brain folded in, under and around itself, it still needed to add important skills. The only solution was to drop some abilities to make room for more important ones. No doubt fascinating gifts were passed up or lost. Based on what other animals evolved, we might have tried sophisticated navigational systems that relied on magnetism or echolocation, like bats or whales, or a complex sense of smell that made a simple stroll the equivalent of reading a gossip column, like dogs. The best survival trick, however, was language, one worth sacrificing large amounts of trunk space for, areas that, want, that might once have housed feats of empathy that would put extrasensory perception to shame. What the brain really needed was space without volume. So it took a radical leap and it did something unparalleled in the history of life on earth. It began storing information and memories outside itself on stone, papyrus, paper, computer chips and film. This astonishing feat is so familiar a part of our lives that we do not think much about it. But it was an amazing and rather strange solution to what was essentially a packing problem. Just store your essentials elsewhere and avoid cluttering up the cave. Thus, the library. But libraries, even if they are collections, are also homes for opposing or contrary thoughts, ideas and views that are dangerous to populists and despots everywhere to any form of majoritarianism. They and the universities, which have libraries, are thus crucibles of dissent and repositories of views of every kind. A thinking republic, the only kind worth having, needs libraries. Our identity as a people is not 
this defined by a majoritarian view or some form of homogeneity. It is defined by the opposite that we have no such singularity. I return to the fundamentals, data, information, knowledge. My argument is this, that the act of harvesting and collecting data, making information and deriving knowledge serve two primary purposes. First, societal improvement, the progression of a society of homo sapiens to greater and greater levels of civilization. And second, control by one group, the overseers, over the other the overseen. Today the latter seems to increasingly overtake the former. It cannot, I argue, be mere coincidence that the rise of the political right parallels the growth, the exponential growth of surveillance, the processing of personal data about the individual gathered and harvested more and more aggressively more and more intrusively. Francis Bacon famously said knowledge is power, knowledge mind you, not information. But the truth is that all surveillance is information and surveillance is therefore and above all about some form or shape of power, that is to say control. Surveillance is everywhere. It is not only about the enemy, whatever or whoever that might be. It is about our daily lives, how we shop, where we travel, what we read, the choices we make. I am sure that many of you like me have been utterly, how shall I put it, uh, discombobulated, no, freaked out is a better word, to find that your cell phone feed suddenly starts peppering you with offers about that trip to Greece you were talking about with your family last night. What on earth is going on? How is this even possible? What part of our lives is any longer truly ours? The more we fill our lives with digital data, it seems, the less we have control over it. Since we are in an institute of science, let me ask if this does not remind you of the fabled Pythagorean cup named after that great man of science and all things triangular, Pythagoras. He is said to have invented this device, a drinking cup, which when filled beyond a certain point, had a siphoning effect, thus draining the contents through the base. It is also known as the cup of Tantalus, never satisfying, always out of reach. It was meant to be a practical joke, but I fear the joke is on us. The more we want, the more control we cede, and the less is truly ours. Remember again that definition of the word data with its connotations of ownership and giving. But if we accept the postulate that data and information are intrinsically worthless, and they gain utility through processing, marking their passage to knowledge, we are immediately in another dimension. We are now in the realm, or approaching the realm, of artificial intelligence. Now, this is an expression I have come to loathe and detest, because it seems to me to imply that left to ourselves, humans have nothing to commend themselves except the converse of artificial intelligence, that is, natural stupidity. Which may well be true in this era of climate change, especially when one sees the official government line on fossil fuels and carbon emissions. Chapter 13 of a 2023-2024 economic survey is a case in point. And I venture to say, some astoundingly inexplicable decisions of the highest courts negating efforts to preserve a unique species. All stuff for another day. AI is a field of science. You know what it means. It refers to the development of technologies that enable computers, machines generally, to learn and to reason, both words in quotes, for these have traditionally been the exclusive domains of humans. Or so we have taught ourselves to believe, which perhaps only 
underscores the profundity of our ignorance. We call this machine learning and deep learning using LLMs, large language models. The applications are many, from self-driving cars and self-flying aircraft to speech recognition, natural language processing and playing chess. AI embraces computer science, data analytics, engineering, linguistics, neuroscience, philosophy, psychology, semiotics, it goes on. As technology advances, our adoption of it increases. No longer is the data we yield a bare bones set of numbers like a date of birth. We have now moved to the level of yielding and having harvested by others far more intangible data about ourselves everything from books to sexual orientation. Why do we do this? Because it is in a word convenient. It makes our lives that much easier. We can pay others swiftly. We can send and receive messages instantly. We share images and then we are told this is important in an interconnected world. Do these technologies enable us to help those most in need of aid? Are there dangers? What are these? Have these technologies unequivocally improved our condition as a species, as a society? Have we become more civil, more just, more equitable? Because this convenience and easiness has a cost. Seeding this level of control is highly dangerous, especially when it is unguided and unsupervised. If surveillance is oversight, we have to ask who will oversee the overseer. That famous Latin phrase, quis custodiet ipsos custodes. Why is this necessary? I cannot begin to describe to you the utter and most abject dismay I have felt when colleagues and others have said to me, my life is an open book. Oh, what is wrong? I have nothing to hide and therefore nothing to fear. Which puts it into a certain perspective that our view of surveillance and our acceptance of it is based on and emanates from a propagation of a culture of fear. This has become more pronounced since 9-11 and the thinking is that surveillance is necessary to keep us safe from harm, especially terrorism. But this so-called necessity immediately lends itself to all kinds of other purposes from control of information about epidemics to film and book censorship, control over art, control over all expressions of dissent, all of these critical to the functioning of any true democracy. So here we have this tension, one of increasing relevance to us between the data about ourselves that we allow to be harvested by others, apparently or ostensibly for the greater good, and our demand for enforcement of a particular human right, the right to privacy, the right to be forgotten the right to be left alone, the right to not yield data. If data harvesting and its uses are swept in as a means to greater convenience, we must acknowledge that without exception, fundamental rights and all human rights are exceedingly inconvenient. And it is for that very reason that we have part three of our constitution to protect these highly inconvenient human and fundamental rights. The concept of a right to privacy is not new. Some have traced it back to 1890 when Brandeis, later US Supreme Court judge, and his then law firm partner Samuel Warren published a paper in the Harvard Law Review, The Right to Privacy. They suggested that there had to be legal recourse against incursions by outsiders into private domestic affairs. The debate went on for about a century, until about 1960, when William Prosser published a study saying that the right to privacy had grown from rights against publishing private data to far wider concerns. He outlined some of these. 
One of these expansions is important to us today, deep fakes, a distortion of a person's image, voice or other personally identifiable data. Privacy is a shape-shifting beast and we must make some effort to define it if we are to assert it as a human right. Some matters are, we say private, nobody's business except ours. But the other dimension is that some aspects must be kept free of intrusion by any authority. In other words, there are parts of privacy where we do not yield data, where we do not cede control, where we contest the power grab. In an excellent article in 2022 in The New Yorker, Why the Privacy Was Rage On, Jeannie Sue Gerson says, in Roe v. Wade, the valence of constitutional privacy, helped along by the sexual revolution of the late 60s, broadened from sacred marital beds and domestic enclosures to personal autonomy and bodily integrity. People having control over decisions about their own bodies free from the state was the core liberty value that privacy represented. The shifting terrain here invites the question of whether, when we talk about the right to privacy, we've been treating as interchangeable two terms that are merely homonyms, roughly privacy as non-disclosure and privacy as non-interference. What about the ugly face of this right? Consider the recent discussions in the past few days in our Supreme Court on marital rape. Does the right to privacy work, as some have argued, as a cover-up for the domestic abuse of women? Gerson goes on to quote Amy Gajda's work, Seek and Hide, the Tangled History of the Right to Privacy, when she says that the right today covers everything from sexual intimacies and private scandals to police eavesdropping and computer data. For many years now, my childhood friend Sham Devan, Vivek's brother, a formidable lawyer from a family of formidable lawyers, has been tirelessly fighting one legal battle after the other about privacy. This is only one of many challenges he has taken on. Delivering the 13th Durgadas Basu Endowment Lecture in 2020 on the Constitution, Liberty and Privacy, Divan opened with this delicious morsel. Digital age provides an inflection point to explore today's theme. The Constitution and liberty are old bedfellows. When did privacy enter this company to create this menage à trois? I, I mentioned this paper by Divan for a reason. It sets the stage for what follows. This is from an early part of it. In the internet age, we must recognize that in order to preserve our liberty in the new interconnected reality, the spaces we must protect and regain, if necessary, are not the traditional ones. Important as the integrity of our body and home was and is, preserving the ownership, control and integrity of our data is the most crucial aspect of preserving liberty. This now means protecting ourselves not just from the state, the traditional contestant in the tournament to preserve freedom, but also private behemoths, the big technology companies who harvest and sell our data. There follows in this paper a fine tracing of the jurisprudential history of the right to privacy in our courts. I will not revisit that. What is important is that in the 2020 lecture, Devan focused attention on that most intrusive of all data gathering measures we know today here, the UIDAI Act and Aadhaar and the Supreme Court's 2017 nine-judge bench decision in KS Putaswami versus Union of India. There are parallel Putaswami cases, Devan has appeared in all of them, but all stem from a challenge to Aadhaar. There is yet pending another dimension which need not detain us today, 
on whether an earlier decision about it being a money bill was or was not correct. But before I move back to the privacy judgment, I must mention the 2019 five judge decision in Putaswami, popularly called the Putaswami Aadhaar judgment. Many things are remarkable about it, but one of the most astonishing things is squirreled away in an editorial comment in a mainstream reporter of law cases. I've never seen anything like this. The Supreme Court judgment in Putaswami Aadhaar with the different opinions of the judges is 940 printed pages. Several of the leading pages are summaries, what we in law called head notes. Buried in these is an entirely gratuitous editorial digression. It goes like this and now I'm quoting exactly. Ed, the issue squarely faced by the court in this case goes to the dilemma at the heart of ethical philosophy. Is it possible to have social progress, a necessary condition for individual flourishing, if the Kantian postulate of never using human beings as a means to an end is taken too literally and dogmatically? Even Kant himself allowed for putting the interests of the commonwealth above those of individuals when it came to preserving preservation of the commonwealth. For without the commonwealth or state, it is simply impossible to have any meaningful civilized existence and that all that obtains is the Hobbesian hugger mugger. Of course, the liberal challenge is always to try and absolutely minimize this use of human beings for the greater good and which must be non-discriminatory. For instance, is secure modern life conceivable without the critical role played by armed forces, police forces or security forces and the secret services in every modern state. This is advocacy for increased surveillance in the name of fear. And do not the rest of us use them as a means to an end when they are sacrificed on the front lines battling for our freedom and security. My travel plans? Where Param and I had dinner last night? Front lines in the battle for freedom and security? Really? It goes on. Should the Aadhaar project, which has finally given a unique, non-duplicable, not true, identity to every one of us, 1.2 billion Indians, something considered impossible, be trashed, maybe some, in, because maybe some invasions of privacy of a few individuals might occur, despite stringent data protection safeguards, what? Or that some very few individuals might be excluded from social security benefits due to system errors? Does not the resultant Aadhaar regime, the one resulting on clarification, reading down, quashing, not find the perfect Kantian balance between individual flourishing and social progress? The stupendous achievement that is the Aadhaar project. I did not make this up. I could not, if I tried. <laughs> Conceptually and philosophically, Aadhaar is and always has been, as Usha Ramanathan, a dear friend, has been saying from day one, problematic. And here's another connection. In late 2013, a few months I was, after I was appointed as a judge, I voiced an objection to it because they said I would not get a salary until I surrendered my Aadhaar number, which I didn't then have. I was smacked down with some derision by my senior colleagues saying I had spent too much time with the Khadi Jhola crowd. <laughs> then the judge who said that to me went on to the Supreme Court and his judgment 
in the Putuswami cases echoes at least a bit of what I complained of and lends credence to one of my long-held beliefs that hindsight is usually the lack of foresight. <laughs> Even today, the problems with Aadhaar are manifold. I had some experience with the precursor when I was doing an arbitration regarding what was called the Bhima Shah project in Rajasthan. Same overall objective, last mile delivery, cutting out the middleman, welfare benefits, all the rest of it. Problems were immense, many of them highly technical. In a polylinguistic country, transliteration is living hell. The name Sangeeta can be spelt two different ways, to have two with a W or an I and have two different identities. This is apart from the outright fudging and manipulation and the entire subculture and industry of faking Aadhaar identities. In another case, we encountered a situation from Aadhaar where an Aadhaar number was issued to with a photograph, lovely photograph, to Palak, son of Kothmir. <laughs> then you had to. Privacy concerns and the evolution of privacy law is the reason why similar enterprises overseas have been abandoned. Aadhaar is the one deeply personal data harvest that is not siloed. No policeman asks you for your passport for a traffic offence and no immigration officer can ask to see your voter's ID or driving licence when you enter or leave the country. Aadhaar negates all of that. The background to the Putaswami privacy case was, as Divan pointed out, a history of its negation. It turned around at first incrementally and then in full form in the nine-judge decision. The Supreme Court unanimously positioned the right to privacy, the right to be left alone, as a fundamental right under our constitution, specifically as part of Article 21, the right to life and personal liberty. It held that while this was not an elitist right, that it was the right of every person being under 21, it was not absolute. Intrusions into individual rights were subject to judicial review by our constitutional courts. An invasion must be legal, it must be founded in law, must be shown to be necessary to achieve a legitimate state aim and must meet a proportionality standard by demonstrating a rational nexus between the object and the means. Justice Call added procedural guarantees against abuse. Now, in that case, the government argued, and this is important, that any claim to a right to privacy must yield to welfare entitlements and measures provided or promoted by the state. The Supreme Court rejects this argument. Among other things, it also held that sexual orientation was an essential facet of privacy, paving the way for gender agnostic legal cultures. Last, it held that informational privacy, that is to say information about the self, is part of the right to privacy. It noted the need for a data protection law and then left this to the wisdom of parliament. This is the background to the recent Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. That a regulatory framework was necessary is, I think, indisputable. After all, if privacy is a fundamental right and informational privacy is included in that constitutional entitlement, then it must surely follow that there has to be a defined, known legislative method to protect that private data and information. In a recent paper with the delightful title Game of Phones in 2024, Devan presented a powerful argument for data protection. I confess I have some quarrel with some of his propositions. Apart from anything else, I have come to view with suspicion and alarm any endeavour by any authority which says that an intrusion into fundamental rights has a particular welfare aim but does not tell me precisely what that aim is. 
I have basic issues too with the DPDP Act. At the forefront, I am wholly opposed to being described by any law as a data principle. We are human beings, individuals, citizens, not agglomerations of data. If you start with this as a precept, that a human being is capable of being mapped from head to toe, we are going to encounter the most insurmountable ethical issues. Medicine and medical research are among the fields where AI applications are said to be poised to bring forth another revolution. Data harvesting for medicine has direct issues relating to confidentiality and privacy. We need to confront these immediately. A detailed discussion on the DPDP Act would be appropriate at some point. I say this because that Act does not provide sufficient guidance for operational purposes. Let's take an example. Let's assume that personal data, which is defined in the Act to mean data that can identify a person by connection to that data, about a person's physical or mental health is being collected by a medical research unit. Many chunks of data will be collected, name, address, mobile number, age, gender, medical history and so on. The DPDP Act talks about consent being sought by the research lab and given to it for use of this data. Remember again this definition of the word data to give. That's why consent. But which personal data? Does the research lab need the patient's name, address and Aadhaar number if it is only doing research, if it is not providing treatment? Can consent once given in that situation be withdrawn even if that data has passed into the research database? What happens to the resultant value of that research if you take out that data? Statistically and scientifically, it will have all kinds of consequences. How will that data be removed from the research? With what assurance? Do we have systems in place to ensure scrubbing of data? That is, removing personally identifiable data and leaving behind the more anonymous data that research needs. Surely research will demand, apart from health conditions, data about age, gender, environmental data, where does she live? In a city? In a village? In what environmental conditions? Think about the impact of pollution on respiration, heart, skin, eyes. Does income data have any impact? How much or how little is to be scrubbed for compliance with this statute? We do not know. But know we must if we are to give full effect and heft to our fundamental right to privacy and also leverage the advantages of modern technology. Should we say, like that editorial, that the advantages are so great that our fundamental rights should be surrendered or compromised? Consider one relatively recent development in the world of deep fakes. We have, I believe, something called adversarial neural networks. Simplified, this means that one machine creates a fake image, picture, movie. The other machine goes about detecting flaws in the fake. The first machine corrects those flaws and makes a better fake. The second one looks for tinier flaws. And this adversarial neural processing goes back and forth until you get... That's right. My concerns run deeper. The point about digital surveillance is not only about government spying on citizens, though that is indescribably bad. Digital access mechanisms now allow manipulation. And there are certainly cases under our draconian laws like the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, where the allegation against the government is of going into a system and planting incriminating data and saying that it belonged to the accused. What is the protection against that? How is that not a violation of the right to privacy? Equally alarming is the over-reliance on the products of data harvesting. 
An emergent issue, which I am in discussions with some persons about even now, is the way in which bank accounts are being frozen because they are non-KYC compliant. Think about what that means. It says that the government's record of your data does not match your actual data. And therefore, the government will freeze your bank account or securities account. Of late, there has been a pushback from the Supreme Court. The earlier view on bail in UAPA cases is being eroded. In Frank Vitus versus Narcotics Control Bureau, something of a breakthrough in my view, the Supreme Court pegged the right to privacy as the basis for turning down a condition that did not just allow surveillance, but ordered a person to share live location data with the police. Recall what I said about surveillance power and control, and now add to that a further element, subjugation. There is now in process a systematic othering of us as a nation, dividing us on the basis of harvested data along lines we never anticipated or imagined, let alone wanted. It is not the isolated chunks of raw data that are in themselves dangerous. It is the systematization of this into a form of knowledge. For example, when religion and caste are tied to occupation, residence and citizenship, that is the beginning of the dismantling of a structured democracy. How we wrest back control of that which defines ourselves is up to us. But it would be a tragic mistake not to appreciate the serious repercussions of, let things, of letting things slide. We, the people of India, is more than a slogan, slogan and not just five words strung together. It is a definition of us as a people, as a nation, as one people, one nation, under a constitution a nation united by the Constitution. Allowing the othering of individuals is a road to divisiveness. It is a path to an unjust, unconstitutional, and undemocratic state of being. We must never forget this much, that human rights and fundamental rights are paramount, and they are boundless. The incursions and intrusions on these are, in contrast, tightly restricted. In a recent judgment, I said that in democracy, governments do not select citizens. Citizens elect governments. Who then, I ask, should be watching whom? I'll end with a favorite verse, one by Bhartra Hari, superbly translated by John Brow in an anthology published years ago by Penguin. It is a love song and I am changing its context for today. It goes like this. There was a time when we did agree that I was you and you were me. What has now come between us two that I am me and you are you? And the answer is CCTV. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.